That was embarrassing. Wow. That's a okay. nice walk up. Well, we've got so, tw 25 minutes, it says there. We've got 20, no, we've not long enough, obviously. Okay. So the last time I interviewed Martin, it was at Madfest's virtual only event back in yeah. September. Now, in the real world, it's far more exciting. So we've got 25 minutes to talk to one of the most important people in advertising. At least in his own mind. At least in his own mind. Sorry. I think a few others too. But let's kick off uh, with some good news. Mm -hmm. You recently said that the advertising sector is better than you've seen in your whole 45 years career. Yes. So why? What's driving this? Well, that may, that may be something to do with S4, if I'm, I'm subjective of about it. But uh, no, it is. Um, you know, I've been at this in one way or another, I suppose, for about, it's almost 50 years, so that makes me extremely old. And um, I, I can remember at Sarch's uh, in Charlotte Street, maybe in the 80s, significant growth, maybe 15, 20% organic growth. That excludes growth through deals. Um, but the underlying, I mean, our Q2 like-for-like uh, -like growth is double the rate, um, probably being indiscreet, but in, with a limited audience, um, is about double where we were in the first quarter. So it's huge. And, and it, the, the, the really interesting thing is, if you went back to the 1980s, which nobody in this room will be able to do, um, we had significant inflation. Now, there, is worry, there are worries about inflation at the moment, and salary inflation, et cetera, wage inflation, but, but in the 80s, we had very significant inflation, and that was one of the problems. So the real rates of growth were actually much lower. So the, the real rates of growth that we're seeing at the moment are huge for two reasons. One is GDP growth, because well, the world will grow this year at about 5 to 6%, which is way above the pre-COVID trend, which was probably around 2 or 3%. Next year, it will probably grow, according to the pundits, 4 to 5%. The issue really is what happens in 23, when most people see it going back to the pre-COVID rates of 2 to 3%. So let's make hay whilst the sun shines. Now, the other thing is, You've got the, the underlying economic growth. The other thing is that I, I think the commentators and, may I say it, journalists, analysts, don't look at the industry the right way. There are really, it's a tale of two cities, or there are two speeds here. Uh, and this festival is around disruption and digital, and that part of the industry. So just think about the industry being about half a billion dollars. It's, it, uh, it's about, uh, sorry, half a trillion dollars. It's a little bit bigger than that last year, about 550 to 600 trillion media. There's about 500 billion in PR and data, and there's another 800 billion in trade budgets, which is what Amazon really focuses on, people forget. So you've got about a 1.7, 1.8 trillion addressable market for people in this room and elsewhere. Uh, of that, half is digital. So going back to the media piece, 550 to 600 billion, about 275, 300 billion is in digital media. You should look at that separately to traditional. Because the six hold codes, or maybe five if you have asses disappeared into Vivendi, but the five or six hold, hold, hold codes, really their problem, and this is a deep seated, seated structural problem, is that they have analog and digital businesses. So they have both cities inside their country, if that's the right way of putting it. And they are faced with structural change in the traditional business. So I think we really have to look at it in, in two ways. We have to look at the traditional part of the industry and the, the digital part. Traditional this year will rebound, driven by the fiscal stimulus. Right? We've seen a huge fiscal stimulus across the globe that's driving GDP growth. The digital part responds to the fiscal stimulus as well, but more importantly, the pandemic has accelerated. Not, I don't think anything new came from the pandemic. It just accelerated the existing trends and made them more apparent. Uh, so I, what you, I'm very bullish about 21 and 22. I'm concerned about 23, not from an S4 point of view, but because of the digital transformation tailwind will still be strong. But I'm concerned about what happens uh, to, the, to the general economy uh, so now, as far as digital transformation is concerned, again, going back to those numbers, digital last year was about 50% of the market. 
This year it will probably be about 55, 60, depending on whose forecast you believe. By 26 or 24, again, depending on who you believe, it'll be like something between 60 and 70% of the market. So you're seeing huge growth on the digital part. And the, and the takeaway for everybody in this room is really to move from the traditional part of the business, if you can, to the digital part. Or start, as we did three years ago, with a clean sheet of paper, that, which is an advantage. I mean, it's a, no doubt an advantage, because you have none of the trappings or the albatross around your neck of the traditional part of the business. Okay, talking digital, obviously the big macro factor that, again, is affecting everyone in this room, I think, is the deprecation of third-party cookies. Yeah. You've been quite vocal on this. So. Do you think the industry is doing enough to get ready for the cookie less future? And what should Browns be doing now? Well, again, you know, there's a thing in the financial community called the VIX index, V-I-X, and that measures the uncertainty in the markets. Uh, and if uncertainty increases, the VIX index goes up, and if it decreases, it goes down. There is a sort of marketing VIX index. There isn't one, but there is a sort of one in people's minds. And the marketing VIX index has gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. And it went through the roof. I mean, people talk about the deprecation of third-party cookies. This actually happened in about January of 2020. I mean, I, was, I remember I was in the Middle East and we had a sort of crisis call because we have a very close relationship with the platforms and obviously with Google. It's our largest client and it's our largest partner, which by the way, it should be. Just, I mean, the numbers, yeah, just, just think about these numbers. I mean, obviously I'm fascinated by numbers. Maybe you in the audience are not, but here I go. Um, that market is 550, 600 billion last year. Uh, Google, probably Google's ad revenues were around 180 billion. If you look at the Q1 of this year, and we'll see Q2 from Google and Facebook and others, you'll hear from Nicola as well later today. If you look at the Q1 and project it forward for this year, it looks like Google will go from 180 billion to 240 billion in terms of ad revenues. Facebook on a similar basis will go from 80 to 110. And Amazon, it's much more difficult to, to find their numbers. They don't give you sort of a clean advertising revenue number, but it looks like it's going from 20 to 25 billion to 35 billion. That is an incremental $100 billion in ad revenues in digital. So this is a huge increase. Pandemic driven, GDP driven, however, it is, it's a huge, huge increase. Anyway, that's the background to the third party cookie thing. So that started in January of 2020. We were obviously we were told then the first Google blog came out. Then we had the second one a few months ago, and really the proverbial hit the fan there. The VIX index went through the roof. People really hadn't focused on it, and of course the latest news is that Google have postponed the implementation for two years. That has created huge uncertainty, and it's a tremendous opportunity. You know we have two practices currently. We have a content practice digital advertising content, which is around 70% of our business, and data and digital media, which is around 30%. We will have a third practice shortly. Uh, we're gonna move into technology services as well, so we'll have uh, three legs to our stool and cover and have an end-to-end -end offer uh, in digital services to compete. I mean, this is a grand, a grand statement to compete against an Accenture or a Glovan, as well as the holding companies. Our key competition, by the way, is not the holding companies. It is Accenture, probably Globant on the tech side. That's where we really, really, the rubber hits the road on digital transformation. But as far as cookies are concerned, the, the, and it's, it's linked to Apple and IDFA and their, their move on IP addresses and privacy. All of this is driven by privacy. All this is driven by recognition by the platforms and the software companies and the hardware companies that the regulators, governments, and consumers would not accept privacy as we currently construct it, and there has to be more, more, a more disciplined approach. What it does is create that uncertainty, and it does uh, two things. One is it, it heightens the importance of first-party data. I know there's a lot of chat about it. First-party data, to state the obvious, is not, by definition, second-party data or third-party data. It is not the data that you get from a Merkle or an Epsilon or an Axiom, or indeed a Cantile, which I have more direct knowledge of, certainly historically. It comes from client-owned data. So the priority is going to be, it is and will be, consolidating, fashioning, developing, 
consented consumer first party data and using the signals from the platforms to help. There's a lot of confusion about this. Ultimately, what it means is the platforms become more important, not less important. There will be this period of uncertainty <clears throat> when consultants such as ourselves, particularly in the data and analytics area, so a second takeaway would be you know, one, the importance of digital, and in fact, is growing at a different speed to traditional. The second is that the uncertainty that exists is so huge that guiding clients through the first party data, signals, platform, complications of, of, of the highest priority. And that's what you see clients do. I don't think, or doing, I don't think clients are happy with it. Because if you went back before Google decided to do what they did, what were they doing? They were going to use third party data to supplement their first party data and the signals. And they sort of thought they had a more independent position. This will increase the dependency, in my view, and view of our, our firm, on the platforms and, and develop their position even more significantly in the long run. So Google, Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, Alibaba, and TikTok. And just one thing on TikTok, we saw the release of ByteDance's ad figures. And I think I'm right in saying Scott Spirit, who works with me, I think had a figure of something like 32 billion of ad revenue. So remember what I said about Google going from 180 to 240, Facebook 80 to 110, Amazon from 25 to 35. TikTok is breaking in. Uh, the, the figure for 19 was something like 7 billion. So they seem to have gone from seven to around, let's say, $30 billion in a couple of years. So it's the, the first one, it's the first significant breakthrough of a platform beyond, let's say, the big five, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, Alibaba. Um, now, there are other imitators of TikTok, like Kaoshu, which are coming to the four too, but it's quite interesting that TikTok have made and ByteDance which is a private company still about to go public, according to reports, but they are starting to make a breakthrough. And to put it into perspective, Snap has done extremely well, is it important, but even in a good year last year, it hit about two and a half billion in terms of ad revenues and, and Twitter and Pinterest are much smaller, sub one billion. So orders of magnitude, they're important to understand because that gives you a signal which way the market's going. So let's talk about some other big issues affecting everyone in this room, one of the biggest issues in our industry, and indeed at the yep. show, is diversity. Uh, S4, you've got a, a completely 50-50 fit uh, male-female board, yep. which puts many of the companies to shame, I'd say. At the same time, we're seeing the gender pay gap from the IPA yep. rising this year. So what are you doing right, and why can't our industry just crack its diversity for Well, we're not, we're not where we want to be. We're 40% people of colour, but, you know, be blunt about it. We, we're very well represented in the Hispanic community. 70% of our business is North and South America. 20% uh, is EMEA, and 10% is Asia Pacific. Our long-term goal is 40-20-40 because of the growth and development in the future, of, particularly of China and India. It will not be easier because of US-China relationships, but that's just the background. Um, so we, we do very well on people of color, particularly against the tech companies and against, say, the holding companies or Accenture or whatever it happens to be. If you break that down, we do very well on Asian, for example, in America, Asian Americans and on Hispanics. But in the Afro-American and black community, we do not do well enough. We're about five, six or seven percent which is fine in California in a sense that we've committed to represent the communities in which we work. So if we're in California, we have about 1,000 of our 5,500 people in California. You know, if they're five, six or 7% Afro-American, we would have hit that target. In New York, it's 25%. Countrywide, it's 13%. We're not 25% New York. So we have a lot of work to do. We're on the cusp, again, this is not, not certain, but but highly likely on the cusp of, of consolidating shortly with a, 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 a significant multicultural agency, which again will improve our representation in the multicultural community. Gender balance is about right. We're not 50-50, but we're 55-45. We do have an issue, to be blunt, um, at a senior level where women are only one third of our executive leadership. We've instituted this We've done two things. The S4 Fellowship Program, which is for black students 
at historically black universities and high schools. Interestingly, we're going to the high schools because the problem in America for Afro-American kids is getting from high school to university. You know, you, the universities, in a way, like Howard, self-select. Mm -hmm. uh, but the issue is going to the high schools. So next year, we're, we're going deep into the high schools. We've already got fellows from, and fellowesses from the, from the historically black universities. And uh, so that's one thing. The second thing we're doing with UC Berkeley is a, seven, is a, a women's leadership um, course over 18 months online, a sort of like a mini MBA, if you like, for our executive leadership. But we'll take, you know, we have probably about 2,500, 2,750 women in the company. We'll take our senior leadership, let's say they're about three or 400, we'll take them through that course uh, over the coming year. So we are doing some stuff, but we're, we're not the most, you know, we're, I think we're moving in the right direction, but we're not moving fast enough. One observation, the biggest determinant of DE and I, in my view, is procurement. Okay. So let me just give you one example. Um, and it was with one of the big tech platforms. Uh, we recently won, we won a pitch, but we recently won it primarily because we, we fielded a diverse team. 40% of the grade, 40% of the grade, was on the diversity of the team, which meant you couldn't get to first base or let alone hit a home run if you didn't have a diverse team. So my view is, you know, there's a lot of virtue signaling going on without being, being too direct about it, being a little bit indirect. There's a lot of virtue signaling, particularly with the holding companies. There's a lot of noise. There's Any a press ones you want to No, there's a press release every day. But what it, how meaningful it all is hmm. when you see the churn inside the companies at senior levels. Um, as one other observation, just on that. Um, I think one of the, the results of the pandemic is that we've had, all of us, without exception, have had 15 months or so to reflect on ourselves, our families, what we do professionally, what we do personally, etc. It's been a highly introspective mm -hmm. period. And if there was a VIX index, an uncertainty index for you know, sort of what's going on in people's minds, so it's not to do with Google and third party cookies or, or what's happening economically, but sort of mentally, there's a tremendous period of reflection. And what we're seeing is, what's the results of that? Well, you're seeing very high churn in terms of reviews. People talk about a second media palooza, a tsunami or whatever. It is, you know, you look at Coca-Cola, you look at Unilever, you look at Bayer, you look at Chanel, there's a whole long list. And most of the holding companies are gonna be preoccupied with defending their positions rather than, you know, they're going to have to, if you're the incumbent, you have to make sure that the trains run on time as well as, you know, repitch the business. Very difficult position to be in. And the second thing we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of churn amongst clients. We're seeing a lot of clients move off to other jobs. We're seeing a lot of people inside agencies move. There's a hell of a lot of churn as a result of what I think we've gone through in the last 15 to 18 months. And I think we're at the beginning of that. Another observation would be, I think companies have been better run, terrible thing for me to say, but they've been better run inside the pandemic okay. than they were before. And what do I mean by that? I mean that central management have not been able to challenge, to travel, myself included, and that has probably meant that people inside companies have had more um, responsibility, control, authority, room to maneuver. And I think actually they've been better run. I mean, that might be again something controversial to say, but I think it is, it is true. But you're going to see, I think, extreme. So for disruptors like us, it is a huge opportunity at the moment. I mean, not only do we high growth in a digital industry, so everybody should be enthusiastic about that, but the 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 challenge to established relationships and established ways of doing it, and I won't. I won't identify the people, but two of the biggest tech platforms have identified ourselves, firstly, as being the only real network in town that's being built, built from, from the bottom up, and secondly, uh, with a new model, and I think this is a big lesson for everybody, with a new model, we provide the agility, the speed, the, the understanding of the digital ecosystem, and the efficiency that is needed. And, one comment made by the CMO of one of the 
biggest tech platforms was um, we don't have to pay for useless overhead. So, so let, well, oh, it's never enough time, but let's go on to another thing that I think, uh, again, everyone in this room is grappling with, the office. Mm. You've recently terminated several office contracts. Uh, yeah. What is the future of the office space, especially if your business which thrives on creativity, which thrives on yeah. people coming together? Well, I'm, I'm 76 and therefore I'm an old fart and therefore I should think about these things uh, in a command and control way. And I think this is, I mean, it may sound flippant, but I, I don't think it is. I think it's the heart of the matter. I mean, I think there are, there are groups of people that believe if you, know, if you can't see people and you can't sort of visually monitor what they're doing, they couldn't be working. Now, in a digital world, you can monitor productivity. Sometimes controversially, but you can monitor productivity. What we've seen in the pandemic is no significant diminution in productivity. If anything, I think probably we're either even Stephen or slightly better. And what we lost you know, in, in maybe work time, we gained by, by the, the, the shortening of commuting time or the non-existent commuting time. Um, so I, I think another good thing about the pandemic is forced to look at the way we do things. And this is apple pie and motherhood now. I mean, it will be a hybrid model it will be something around 60% of the working week in the office on average. There will be jobs like coding that can be done remotely 100% of the time. There will, be, there will be people who don't have, who live with their parents, who live with young children, who can't spend time at home, who don't have the resources at home, that want the resources of the office. So it's forcing us, I mean, in Q2, we got a lot of requests from our offices were in 56, 57 cities, and we get, we've gone to a unitary structure. So, for example, here in London, we're moving not, not many, many uh, um, feet or meters away from here. We're moving into a new building. We'll be in it for a year. And then we, we, that means we'll consolidate down to two buildings here in London, and then we'll move into one building uh, after that. So we'll be unitary. But with, there are three things that we're looking at. We're looking at space for work, Space where we, we, inter we connect with colleagues inside, inside the, the firm. And then space where we, we, we connect with clients. So it will be a very different space to what we were customarily using. And we're going to invest more in the, in the people. I mean, the, the traditional agency structure, about 60% of revenues, net revenues, are invested in people and about somewhere between 7 to 10% in rent. Okay. I mean, I don't know how people feel about this in this audience, there may be some landlords, but I do not like paying rent, <laughs> and I do not like being locked into 21-year leases or 20-year leases with upward-only reviews. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have gone for much more flexibility. That's why we support models like WeWork or Regis or whoever it happens to be, because we think that gives us the flexibility. In our business, you win a piece of business, you have to expand. You lose a piece of business, you have to contract. Locking yourself into property and paying a landlord escalating rents is not something. So that's one of, I think one of the good things that will come from the pandemic is that the nature of cities is going to change and their importance is going to change and their relative importance is going to shift. So we're going to look at it differently. But we will go to unitary office structure. We'll be using less space. We're, 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 it's not easy to get people to change their thinking, but we're pushing very hard to change thinking. And I think we will give people the flexibility. So on July the 19th here, you know, we'll, we'll encourage people to wear masks, we'll encourage vaccination, we'll encourage people to, to come into the office if they wish to, but we're not going to force it. So we will not be take the view, as one of our advisors, the, or the CEO of one of our advisors that said, you know, if you can go to the restaurant, you can come into the office. That is not the view that we take. So we're not, a, we're not part of the command and control economy. Uh, we're slightly different. We're much more flexible. Okay. I want to, uh, oh, at this point, I want to open things up to the audience, if, okay. uh, if that's possible. Um, we have a question in from John Regan. And I just want to encourage you all to download the MadFest app and ask your questions uh, to Sir Martin Sorrell. Uh, and then we'll throw them up on the big board. Uh, we have a time for a couple. Um, John Regan, who's the CEO of MyMine, which uh, does situational targeting, he, he's asked, 
Um, there's a, you've talked about a lot of different kinds of disruption. Uh, which which one would you would you say has the greatest potential to disrupt S4 Capital? Um, well, if I look at the competition, we have we sort of have we have sort of three levels of competition. We have the direct competition. So currently, we have two practices around content and data and digital media. So you have specialists in each of those practices. So that's sort of at the micro level. So that's one area of competition and potential disruption. The second level is the hold co's who have bits. You know, the bits could be huge or RGA or AKQA or VML, let's say, let's take pick those out, or maybe widen as well as an independent, so-called quote unquote independent. Uh, that's the second level. And then the third level is Accenture, and I use Globant as an example. Globant comes, I mean, Globant has gone into the marketing space in Spain recently with Habitant, but, but basically it's sort of in the IT. I mean, just from a digital transformation point of view, we hit, hit clients through the CMO function. Uh, a Globant or Accenture hits them through the CIO, CTO function. And then in theoretically, we would meet in the middle. Uh, so what we're trying to do, and I mentioned technology services as being an area that we will go into shortly, what we're trying to do is to cover the map end to end so that we can attack digital transformation, not just from the CMO's point of view, but from the CIO or CTO point of view. So potential disruption is that, is that. Then there are new technologies because the, you know, I said, I said gaily, you know, it can get to 70% Digital can be 70% of the market by, let's say, 2026. At some point in time, it hits saturation. So what are the things that we're doing? And you'll see us make a move shortly to set up something structurally adjacent to S4, not a part of S4, but structurally adjacent to S4, which will help us try and figure out what's going to happen. And you know, we, we don't have, you know, the... the we don't have a 100% vision on this, but to help us figure out what the next new things are going to be. That might be virtual reality, obviously AI and areas like that, augmented reality. I mean, I'll give you an example of what we've done recently. So we took the technology of the, un the a Fortnite technology, Epic technology, the Unreal Engine, and we've built a studio in New Delhi uh, we took over the, the old studio of CNBC TV 18 uh, in New Delhi and we built this uh, Unreal Engine studio. We can produce content from anywhere, high resolution, high quality content from anywhere in the world in that studio. So it's a technology that, and it's, this is what sort of brought it to mind in, in trying to answer the question a year ago when we were having our daily meetings. Uh, we have sort of daily management meetings on people, on clients and finances. That largely driven by the pandemic, but it's become sort of our normal way of working. And we, we, we fastened in on this technology about 15 months ago, or 12 months ago, and have started built around it. So what we're trying to do to deal with that question of disruption, because when we get to saturation in digital, we'll be facing the same, the same issues as, let's say, the whole codes are, are facing now is that they, they have a business rooted in the analog, uh, analog industry rather than digital industry. So I would say that's, those are the competitive areas we have to think about. That's fantastic. I've got another question here from to Toby Beresford. Uh, if you're actually in the room and not online, feel free to stand up and wave. Um, and, and actually, I think the AV team may be able to put this question on the screen for everyone to see. He says, uh, in 2019, Roblox spent 74 times more on digital than UEFA. Are existing rights holders and media owners under leveraged and under investing in digital even now? Um, I think the answer to that, the simple answer is yes. And what you're going to see, I mean, there's this big debate about sports rights and whether sports rights are overvalued, correctly valued or undervalued. I think they're undervalued. Uh, the, 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 the move towards the European Championship, the, the, the ill-fated Ill move, in my own view is, that is the first sort of, that's the first battle in a war, if you like. 
that, uh -huh. it, that, so it, it, that, it, that it will happen right. at, will happen at some point point in time um it just was dare i say it mishandled uh, in the in the way that it was was implemented but it was it was symptomatic of what is going to happen when you start to see what the platforms are doing the hardware companies and the software companies are doing in the area of sport which is critically important uh, from a consumer point of view I, I think you're just seeing the beginnings thing. so a, if you think about that European Super League and the potential sponsors for that um, you know it's obvious who who those would be if you look at you know the underbidder for the IPL, I always remember this, so I was still at WPP, and Star won it. This was before Star was absorbed by Disney, but the underbidder was Facebook by a fraction. And you've seen Facebook, Amazon, Google, and others start to do sports sponsor. I think in the case of Google, they've gone for the more sort of um, the less uh, mass sports. They've sort of focused on more specialist sports, so they've gone for, for sports assets that they really think are undervalued, right, um, because of their, their sort of lack of, of mass penetration. But I think the answer to the question is a resounding yes. I would be very bullish on sports rights in the long run. Of course, the pandemic has created a lot of uncertainty as to the value of football clubs, the value of... You know, one of the, the thing that people missed on the European Championship was the salary cap. Because from an owner's point of view, what's the biggest problem with the Premier League is there is no, you know, in the NFL, there's a salary cap. You know, salaries, players' wages cannot be greater than a certain proportion, I can't remember what it is, might have been 60% of revenues. That's the reason why the football clubs have been unprofitable. So from an owner's point of view, obviously the, the conflagration was around our football clubs owned by the Glazers, in the case of Manchester United, or they owned by the Manchester United fans. You know, that classic thing with Chelsea Football Club, where the pitch had been sold, you know, the, the turf had been sold, and the question was, you know, if, you, if, if Chelsea you know, moved into this, the Super League, what happens to the pitch? Um, so there's that, that, that problem. But having said that, I think that's a, it's an enormous area of opportunity. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your many, many questions on the app. Sadly, we cannot get to Any, Anybody more. wants more questions? Just to prove that there are people out there that have been listening to this, martin at s4capital.com.